Chapter 14, San Francisco County. I was released from prison on June 4th, 1992, after serving almost four years on a seven-year bid. I felt like a new man with a righteous purpose. I was a full-fledged member of the Nuestra Raza. I had honored my loyalties as a dedicated Northaniel behind the walls and was eager to let the streets know it. I had become a product of what the prison environment transformed me into and was nothing like I was before I went in. I almost felt like I was coming back from serving a tour of military duty and had a huge chip on my shoulder. I went back to doing robberies almost immediately from the gate. Most of these were just nickel and dime strong arm robberies to get myself on my feet, but eventually I resorted to takedown robberies using my weapon of choice, a 9mm semi-automatic. I was targeting everything from bars, liquor stores, small family owned businesses to grocery stores and banks. I was hitting licks with a renewed fervor. Prior to going to prison in 1989, I was introduced to a woman during the brief time I spent in the San Mateo County Jail. We hooked up the same night I got out and I saw her a few more times before going back on my first violation. By July 1992, she realized she was pregnant, but things didn't work out between us. We were at two different places in our lives. She would later give birth to my first and only son, but my contact with her and my son over the years was very limited. She wanted the type of committed relationship that I wasn't willing to give her, and we grew apart. As with a lot of women, she sheltered my son and refused to let me see him since I chose not to be in a relationship with her. Unfortunately, she chose to keep it that way, and this is how it's been ever since. One day, I ran into one of my closest homeboys, Jesus Chuy Guerrero, from my neighborhood. We were at La Raza Park in the Mission District when a car with two beautiful women pulled up and parked. Chewy knew the driver, and I walked over and introduced myself to the passenger. Her name was Connie, but they called her Concha, and after talking to her for a few minutes, I realized that I had actually started riding her the last couple of months when I was in Susanville. She was gorgeous. She had long black curly hair with a flawless face, a honey brown complexion, and her body was unbelievable. We had been corresponding for a couple months, but ended up losing contact. Before they left, I got her number and told her I'd call. Within that same week, I met another homeboy from my neighborhood named Orlando Weasel Hernandez that I'd eventually become real tight with. I met Weasel at the Army Street Projects while I was with another homeboy of mine, Ray Machado from Excelsior Park. Army Street Projects were in the heart of the Mission District and was a hot spot for crack cocaine and chronic. Ray had a Sancha that lived in the projects, so while he was with her, I ran into Weasel. He was a dark complected Puerto Rican dude, about 6'2 and a solid 260. He had just paroled from Old Folsom and his show. We both had that prison glow and were healthy. From the gate, we hit it off. He was also a newly committed NR member and we spent the next couple of weeks terrorizing the neighborhood. We were muscling in on street dealers, committing strong arm robberies and doing home invasions, anything to generate money. I had initially committed myself to functioning in the San Francisco Street Regiment while in Susanville with Federico Aravalo, but due to a personal issue with one of the regiment's members, Ricky Duck Cedillo, I hadn't plugged in yet. Prior to getting shipped off to prison in 1989, I was involved with a woman by the name of Marlene. She visited me while I was in the county jail and stood by me up until the last year of my seven year prison stint. When she fell off and stopped writing me, I found out that she became involved with Duck and that they had just given birth to their first son. Marlene was my old lady and after four years, there were feelings involved. It wasn't like she was just another one of my little bitches. She was my girl. I knew who Duck was as he was from my neighborhood and he was also an NR member. In my mind, he had violated one of our most forbidden laws, fucking around with a fellow member's old lady. Coincidentally, I ran into Marlene a few days after I got out, driving down Mission Street with a relative. She was by herself, pushing Duck's newborn baby in a stroller. I was still a little upset about the way she had cut out on me, but I still pulled over and stopped. Off the bat, she claimed to be a victim of the battered woman syndrome. 
She told me that Duck was beating her, that he was taking the baby's food money for drugs, that she deeply regretted leaving me in the whole nine yards. Needless to say, I didn't believe shit she was telling me because I knew how scandalous she was, but I played along with her little game. I ended up taking her to the Civic Center Hotel where my mom was staying. I wanted to get her baby off the streets, but for me, this was a perfect opportunity to give Duck some of his own medicine and get Marlene alone to have my way with her. When we got to the hotel, I paid for a room and took her upstairs. This was one of them sleazy hotels that held a mix of shooting galleries, crack spots, and prostitution conclaves. About an hour of listening to the details of their pitiful relationship, I had my mom watch the baby while Marlene and I went back to the room. Marlene was a very attractive young woman with a beautiful body. Even after giving birth to her son, she was mixed with Mexican and Filipino and she had all the appealing features. After I slept with her, I wanted to make her feel like a cheap piece of meat. Not only because of what she did when she left me, but because I knew she was going to go back to Duck and try playing both of us. I flat out told her I didn't even enjoy fucking her. I did it so I could rub Duck's face in it and get him back for what he did to me. After we were done, I told her to put her panties back on and not to even look at me. I told her, as a matter of fact, you disgust me so much. Why don't you just fucking turn around and face the wall? The next morning when she woke up, she apparently thought I was going to feel sorry for her and apologize for the way I treated her. But the apology never came. I went to my mom's room, got her son, and told her to leave. I felt bad for putting her out with her baby, but I wanted her to feel some of what she made me feel. I hadn't planned on making an issue out of it by going out of my way to look for Duck, especially since they had already had a son. I hadn't planned on making an issue out of it by going out of my way to look for Duck, especially since they already had a son. But if I ran into him, I was going to try to hurt him and let it be known that I, he wasn't going to get away with disrespecting me. Even though we were both NR members, I felt like I would have been justified because he had it coming. I knew where Marlene lived in the Cortland district, but I figured she wasn't worth my time since she was just as much at fault. I never made any attempts to go by her house, but one night when I was with a couple homeboys driving around in my boy's truck, I spotted Marlene and Duck together on a bus. I knew the bus's route and I knew it was en route to Marlene's house. I told my boy to speed up and drive me to the block that Marlene lived on before the bus got there. But as we drove by, Duck spotted me in the truck and became visibly nervous. He knew that we were eventually going to run into each other and he would have to deal with me one way or the other. When we got to the corner of Marlene's block on Andover, I jumped out with the 38 revolver and told my homeboys to wait for me on the corner. I ran down to Marlene's house and ducked behind a car in the neighbor's driveway. As I waited for the bus to turn on to Andover, I was already weighing out in my mind how far I was going to take this. When I was in Susanville, I wanted to kill this fool, and I used to play the whole scene out in my mind. But I had calmed down a lot since then and decided it wasn't worth it. He definitely needed to be taught a lesson for disrespecting me. On the other hand, I wasn't in love with Marlene, and I knew I could possibly face serious consequences for an unsanctioned killing on a member of the regiment. Besides, I didn't know all the homeboys in the truck good enough to place that kind of trust in them. If I murdered this fool, one of them definitely would have told on me. Up until that point, I was taking this into my own hands, but I still needed to be careful. I decided I was going to at least shoot him and wanted Marlene to watch me do it. That would be my get backs, either take an arm or leg shot, or maybe just even in the nuts. As the bus came down the street, I caught a quick glimpse of Marlene and Duck standing up. It looked like they had been standing at the back door waiting to get off, but were now headed back to where they were sitting. This didn't make sense. Why weren't they getting off the bus? Duck didn't see me in the neighbor's driveway, but he was scanning the street real closely. Then I realized what must have happened. They obviously saw the truck I was in parked down the block and knew I was somewhere hiding on the street. I watched the bus drive down to the corner. It kept going without Marlene or Duck getting off. The following day, I got a call from Eddie Little Roach Oroche and William Dreamer Fernandez, whom I knew both were overseeing the regiment. 
I guess they ran into Weasel and asked him for my number. I had never dealt with either one of them personally, but I had heard of Little Roach and his older brother, Louis Big Roach or Roach him, as they had a lot of influence in history in my neighborhood. As soon as Little Roach introduced himself, he cut straight to the chase and said he was calling in regard to an issue concerning me and one of the brother's old ladies named Marlene. Duck had apparently addressed the issue, making it appear as if I was the one who had an affair with Marlene while they were together. Marlene told him about the night we spent at the hotel together and now Duck was obviously trying to flip this around on me. He failed to mention the fact that Marlene was with me before I went to prison and that he was the one who had the inappropriate affair while she was my old lady. Little Roach wanted me to meet him and Dreamer at La Raza Park the next day so that we could get together and resolve the issue. Despite the fact that these brothers were supposed to be my brothers, I didn't trust them. I wondered if they had ulterior motives for wanting to meet, especially in light of the fact that Duck was a member of the regiment and I didn't know who else he might have told. I thought about the possibility of being led into a trap or being ambushed, but despite my apprehensions, I still agreed to meet them the next day. Early the next morning, I called a homeboy of mine named Gus Machado, Ray Machado's younger brother from Excelsior Park, and gave him a brief rundown of the situation. I knew I could trust him and told him I wanted him to come with me. Gus brought a 9mm Glock, and I had a 44 semi-automatic that I borrowed from another one of my homeboys. Gus wasn't involved in politics. He was just one of them kind of dudes you could count on. And he had never even been to prison. In fact, he was enlisted in the army and was trying to do something positive with himself. But we were childhood friends and I knew he had my back. I didn't want to meet Little Roach and Dreamer in the mind frame as if I was expecting a confrontation. I needed to make sure I was securing myself since I really didn't know what I was walking into. When me and Gus pulled up to Ladasa Park, Little Roach and Dreamer were already there, posted up on a bench. I told Gus to hang back while I walked over and talked to them, but also told him to keep his eye open for anyone else that might try to walk up and blindside me. I threw a hoodie on and kept my finger on the trigger during the entire conversation. Of course, neither of them were aware of this. Years later, we laugh about it after I told Little Roach when we were in Pelican Bay together. Needless to say, the meeting went on without incident. In short order, Little Roach asked me to cut my losses and leave it alone. Even after finding out that Duck was the one who got involved with Marlene after we were already together. He understood the situation and tried to rationalize it with me. He said, look, Box, I know this fool pulled a scandalous move, but you gotta ask yourself, do you really love this bride? And then to top it off, they have a baby together. I'm asking you to be the bigger man and just let it go. I told him that I had no intentions on seeing Marlene anymore that I, and that I'd leave Duck alone, but also suggested that they still hold Duck accountable for his actions as he was in violation for doing what he did. Either way, I felt content with the fact that I had obviously pumped some fear into Duck and that I had fucked around with Marlene the same way he did to me. After the issue with Marlene and Duck was resolved, we then discussed street business and whether or not I was going to commit functioning within the regiment. I agreed to work with them and was officially plugged in that same day. But a week later, I got picked up with Weasel for a strong arm robbery.